Hello, my name's Tony Williams. <clears throat> I work for a German MSP called Gemix. And today I'm talking about implementing uh, security. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Oran Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where I sit to record this presentation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Security is vital. Security is important. It doesn't matter what your enterprise, it doesn't matter your size. You need to be more secure. Security is hard. The most secure computer is one with the power off and locked in a bank vault, but that's not very usable. Security systems are a balancing act between usability and security. An organization I worked with had a barely working security benchmark for months. It was working fine when it was built from Mojave, but from Mac OS Catalina on, it became increasingly difficult to make the changes for every change Apple made. <clears throat> the Mac OS Security Compliance Project is an open source effort by a number of US government agencies with help from others such as JAMP and Center for Internet Security. Out of the box, it supports 10 variations of six different security benchmarks and provides for both checking and remediation. It is up to date. A version for Monterey, for example, was available swiftly. There is already a version available for Ventura. The project is well supported. The project's main sponsor, the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, has the task of setting security standards for the US government. So it's in its best interest to support the project well. It is also easy to understand at both the security level, <coughs> where everything is clearly set out, and at an implementation level, where the project has some excellent documentation. At the bottom level, the atomic level, are the rules. The tool chain has a list of about 300 rules, though none of the benchmarks enforce more than about 200. The main reason for that is that some of the rules are quite similar to each other. Each rule is in a separate YAML file. Here is an example. A few things to notice here. Right up the top is an ID. Audit control owner configure. There's that ID is used throughout the toolset to refer to this rule. About halfway down is a single shell command that checks if the rule is adhered to. Just below it is what the system should expect from running the command, in this case, the number zero. Then it has a shell command that will fix the Mac if it is broken. After that is a list of where in a benchmark the rule can be found. Notice close to the bottom, it has an N slash A. That means this rule is not in that particular benchmark. Excuse me for a minute, I have to totally geek out. When I was preparing this presentation, I found an almost error in that rule. It doesn't affect anything, so it is a bit inconsequential. Look at that check command. Hang on, let's run it. So we can see we get the expected result, zero. If we run it without the AWP, we see why. The third field is the user ID of the file's owner, root, zero. Notice that there is no D at the left-hand end of the permissions. Audit control is a file, not a directory. Look what happens when I run the command with just minus n instead of minus dn. I get exactly the same output because the minus d in ls means treat a directory like an ordinary file and don't search it recursively. But we aren't listing any directories, just one ordinary file. So if we take the d out of our check command, we still get the right result. So not really an error, but perhaps something that should be fixed. Back to our presentation. Here is a rule in the YAML file, and here is another rule. Some rules don't have a remediation because the expectation is that a config profile controls it. I've cut some stuff out of the middle of this rule so you can see the bottom. Notice that the fix tells us this rule is controlled by a config profile. The next piece is a baseline. A baseline is a list of the rules that comprise a benchmark. 
Here is an example from the C Center for Internet Security, CIS, level two baseline. At the top, you can see ex some explanatory text, then the list of rules. Notice that it's broken up into sections. Those sections become uh, chapters in the PDF documentation. The first rule we looked at had an idea of audit control owner configure. The second, with profile details, was OS airdrop disabled. I've underlined them in the baseline so you can spot them. Once again, a reminder that they're indexed in the baseline and everywhere else by that ID. The final component of the formal toolset is a Python script, Generate Guidance, which does a number of things. The first, <coughs> obviously, is to generate guidance. This is a PDF containing all the rules you're enforcing and some supporting materials, such as a list of relevant documents, a list of acronyms used. Remember this rule? It was the first one we saw. The guidance is generated as an ADOC file and then translated into HTML and PDF. This is a piece of the PDF for that rule. The guidance for CIS level two is 122 pages. Some of them <coughs> reach up close to 200. You can see how the various parts of the rule we looked at ended up in the guidance. You can see the check command and in the remediation description is the fix command. Here is the remediation description from our second rule. There is the preference domain, the key, and the value. The second task of our script is to generate config profiles for all the rules that can be enforced with one, such as the one we just saw. Here is a list of them from a particular baseline. Notice that both a preference peer list and an unsigned mobile config file are generated, making it easy to implement in your MDM. You can see there com.apple.application access from our rule OS Airdrop Disable. Here is the contents of that <coughs> config. The first item in the dict is our key, allow airdrop. This config profile sets five keys, so it'll be mentioned in five rules. The final piece it generates is the compliance script. This is a shell script that both checks and remediates the rules in our benchmark. It is many thousands of lines long. Now that I've shown you the major components of the tool chain, let's start building our security solution. Before we do, I want to mention talking to your security team. They're meant to be the experts, so have a conversation with them about exactly which benchmark they would prefer you use, and then discuss changes you might want to make to that benchmark. If you don't have a security team, then perhaps your auditors or your insurance company would provide some guidance. So how do we change the rules? Um, I thought disabling Bluetooth so nobody could use Bluetooth headphones was too restrictive. That was a fairly easy one for security to approve when we discussed it. Now that we've talked to security, let's start building our solution. First off, grab the tool chain from GitHub. Seriously, do this every time. Don't use the copy you grabbed three months ago. It will quickly come down into a directory, Mac OS security. The tools have some requirements you might not have. So go to the top level directory, Mac OS security, and run bundle install to grab the Ruby needs and pip install minus r requirements.txt grabs them for Python. Now we want a baseline. Copy the baseline we want to use into the repo's custom folder with a new name. I will change mine to CIS underscore level two underscore example dot YAML. You could use the name of your company or your division instead of example. We put our baseline in the custom folder so that when we pull down a new version of the repository, our custom pieces will be unchanged. Time to make the changes security agreed to. Do this by commenting out lines in your YAML file. Don't take them out. <clears throat> um, in my example, you can see a couple of Bluetooth rules 
that are commented out and the fallible enforce rule as I handle it outside of this project. Commenting out rather than removing the lines makes it easier for security audits. You can see what's in, in front of you, what's changed. Time to run generate guidance again. This time we will pass it some command line arguments. Minus P asks the script to generate the config profile and minus S asks it to generate the compliance script. It reports a great deal about its activities as it's running, most of it about the config profiles it creates. <clears throat> this will generate a directory inside the build directory named after the YAML file and it contains all the pieces we need. Notice the ADOC, HTML and PDF versions of the guidance, as well as our mobile configs. Time to build the results into the MDM, in my case, Janf. First off, create a category for all the scripts, policies, and profiles. Mine is CISL2. Create a computer group for testing. Mine I call CISL2 test in shrieky all caps so you notice it in the scope easily. Of course, eventually you'll have this running on all the computers, but for testing we will just add a few to our group. Now we need to create a config profile. Back when we ran the guidance script to create all the config profiles, the script told us this. Note, if an MDM is already being leveraged, many of these profile settings may be available through the vendor. What that means is that the, our MDM might have a lot of these settings that can be done via a GUI. Indeed, Jamf does. Create a config profile to set them all. Call it something like 0.0, .0 CIS L2 restrictions. That puts it right up the top of the list of config profiles within the group. Go through the GUI and the PDF and any of the settings that are in the JAMP profile GUI, set them the correct way. All of section six in our CIS level two can be skipped over, but right off the bat 7.1, disable airdrop, is under the media tab of restrictions. Make sure it's not selected and so on. Go through the GUI. Start back at the beginning of the PDF and go through the rules again. Some of the rules can't be set in the JAMP GUI, but can be set using one of the config files generated by the script. An example of this is firewall locking. Its remediation tells us the payload and what should be in it. Go to the mobile configs preferences folder and you can see a file with the same name as the payload. Here is what, this look, what it looks like and you can see it sets enabled logging to true and logging option to detail. Notice it also sets enable firewall and enable stealth mode to true. <clears throat> Those two must be in, in other rules, but we will still set them in this config profile. Just make sure to put, it, put the information in the note for the profile as to exactly which rules it sets. This is what the general section of our profile will look like. <clears throat> Notice that we had put it in the category CASL2, and it is, of course, computer level, and of course, we wanted to install it automatically. Now we go down to the application and custom settings section and select upload. upload. On the right, we can then click plus add. This is how we set it up. The property list contains the contents of the file from mobile configs preferences, and the preference domain should be set to the name of the file. A quick feature request for Jamf. When we upload a file, can you fill in the preference domain using the name of the file? <clears throat> It'd be much easier for us if you could. Now it is almost time to upload the script that was generated. First, we need to give it a quick edit. These lines check the number of arguments passed to the script. And as you may know, Jamf passes three arguments before any we want. So this check has to be removed. You can find these lines just above the only call, the Z pass opts. 
they may have already been removed. The project has a pull request to make some changes to the argument handling, which remove these lines. So if they aren't there, don't worry. Set the general pane of our script for the display name and assign the script to our category. Copy and paste the entire five or 6,000 lines of the script into the script pane. Another feature request you have, could we have the ability to just upload our script instead of copy and paste? Finally, we set the parameter for label in the options pane. We set it to the possible arguments of our compliance script. We only use check and fix at the moment in our system, but put the others in so you remember what they are and that they're there. On to two extension attributes. The first lists the ID of any rule currently not compliant. Create a new extension attribute in Jamf Pro's settings section. Set the data type to string, the input type to script, and paste this into the contents before saving. Name it CIS audit list. The second extension attribute is the count of the rules that are broken. I named mine CIS audit count. Now for smart group. Name it CIS non-compliant with a criteria of the audit count extension attribute more than zero. We need a number of policies. The first one is CIS check that runs a check-in and has a custom trigger of CIS underscore check. Then we have CIS fix, which only runs at the trigger CIS fix. Both these policies run the compliance script, setting that fourth argument to minus minus check and minus minus fix respectively. Next is CIS fix controller. This runs at check-in, but is scoped only to our smart group. It runs this script. This is an important script, so let's go through it slowly. This script remember, only runs when the check finds a problem. At the top, it writes the date and a list of the broken rules to a text file on the Mac. That gives us a good log for the security team after somebody breaks. Then it runs our policy, CIS fix, to fix any problem. Hopefully, we, haven't fi we have fixed everything. So we run the check again which will write a plist file with no findings. Finally, we do a jam for recon, so our extension attributes are updated with a count of zero, and our Mac drops out of the non-compliant group. It is the check done at every check-in, and this script that runs when a problem is found that is the core of our solution. Just a couple of things I'd like to mention before we move on. The directory slash library slash management that you can see in this script <clears throat> is a folder that I use on my standard environment to hold bits and pieces for Jamf and my other tools. If you have another folder, another folder you use for the same purpose, then sure, use it instead. Second, the audit peer list put into slash library slash preferences isn't actually a preference file. It is just put in there because the project needed a spot to put it and library preferences is certain to exist and certain to be write writable by our compliance script. The final policy we want is one that makes the Mac compliant when it is enrolled. The compliance script doesn't like running the fix before a check, so we need a small line in files and processes of our policy. We run the check, as you can see, then the fix without writing out to our log because this isn't a broken rule. It's just setting things that aren't set by a profile. Finally, let's discuss the preference file for our compliance script. It is a long sequence of keys with each key being one of the rule IDs and under that a key exempt that starts off as false but can be set to true so the rule is skipped. This means we can have a config profile scope to a particular group that we might need to be less secure. As an example, the Mac I use to build and upload application install packages sits in a locked room 
and I want it to log back in after a power outage. That means I would set this key to true and scope that config profile to that particular Mac. Doing all that by hand is tedious and error prone though. Instead, we can use a tool written by Bob Gendler, generate underscore json.py, which generates the JSON for a custom schema we can upload to a JAMP config profile. I will have a pointer to the tool at the end of the presentation. Drop the file into the scripts folder and run it with this line, pointing it to the same custom YAML file. Create a config profile and in the application and custom settings section, select external applications and set it up like this, upload in the JSON file generated as the custom schema. This is a section of the GUI you then get. At the top and bottom, you can see two rules that have not been touched. They are marked not configured. When we change that to configured, you can see the rule OSHTTB disable has had exempt set to true, which then requires a reason, and we've given one. That concludes my presentation. Here are some pointers to where things can be found. So that was an explanation of how I use the Mac OS security project to better secure my Macs. I hope you found it useful. Thank you for listening.